Hey guys, Mark here from Labyrinth Studios. Welcome again to another episode of the Labyrinth Studios podcast. Today I'm joined by our good friend Gaz Peacham. Gaz is a musician, uh, a music promoter and former music venue operator. How's it going, Gaz? I'm very well, thank you, Mark. Good, glad How to are hear you? it. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, good. not too bad. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess just tell us uh, a little bit, your sort of brief overview of your career thus okay, far. Yeah. I know it's quite, a quite brief, expensive. I, don't know how yeah. brief, I was going to say, I don't know how brief it can be. Uh, it's been a fairly interesting journey. I mean, I guess I've been a musician since I was very young. I think I first picked up a guitar around the age of seven. I was in the first band when I was about 12. So I've been involved in music since a very early age. Um, I went and studied music at NCN College when I was in my teens. Um, and uh, after that, I started getting into promotion. And well, actually, first of all, I started getting into um, media, I guess. I, I ran a magazine for a little while um, mm. and worked with Left Line quite closely in their early days um and then from that became promoter at junction seven and the old angel sort of this is like turn of the century around 2000 2005 sort of between those sort of years and then uh, and then i started working at the maze uh when it had just reopened sort of 2006 um and ended up working there for 15 15 odd years or something um and eventually by the time i'd left there i'd, I'd gone from from barman and promoter to general manager, uh, well, sister manager, general manager, part owner, full owner, and then me and my, my wife ended up owning it for several years before we uh, eventually decided to close in 2019. Um, and along that way, I was also obviously in several bands and have managed to be lucky enough to play quite a lot of gigs and festivals and tour around Europe a bit. So yeah, it's been a, a fun journey. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, you've you've had quite a history as a musician, um, playing in a lot of different bands over the years. Um, I guess going to, we'll start with the maze first, because mm. um, yeah, I mean, there's a load of interesting history there. <laughs> um, and yeah, like you say, you know, you kind of started uh, started getting into promotion, um, working in music venues, you know, kind of eventually leading to you working at the maze, and and then eventually getting to the point where you know you were operating the place yeah um yeah the maze you know i mean i know for me personally so just you know to sort of fill our viewers in mm. uh the maze is a local music venue in nottingham in the uk uh or it was um yeah former music venue mm. um yeah really quite a sort of um historic like seminal music venue for the local nottingham music scene um so many bands and and artists have played there over the yeah. years including you know people like jake bug um and i know it, the maze was quite an important venue for jake he actually did um uh, a sort of homecoming show yeah. uh, many years back you know when when he first got signed um it was sort of like a secret show thing yeah i mean it? that was yeah. a really special show i mean we, we i think we sort of we got a bit lucky in a lot of ways but i mean i mean i say lucky but i guess we were also just part of it of hitting nottingham in a really nice sort of wave of talent coming through like you say the likes of jake Bug and uh many of the artists who you know sleaford mods and many mm. artists who were sort of just starting to break through to the mainstream from nottingham for the first time in a long time there was a real sort of wave of nottingham bands coming through and the local scene was really exciting and that was at the time we'd sort of just built up the maze um, and like I say I guess we we're part of it because we were giving a lot of bands chances and trying to fill the nights every night with local artists um, so we had we were lucky enough to have the likes of Jake Bug and Sleaford Mods play uh, some really early gigs at the maze and like you say Jake came back after he'd signed after he'd had his first album go global and huge came back and played his secret show at the maze and it was really weird sort of you know I, I have a very vivid memory of sitting in the dressing room chatting to Jake at that show um, and you know I remember Jake coming and playing shows when he was very young, sort of 14, 15, mm. um, playing with you, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, and um, 
and and being a quite a shy young lad just playing his music and coming back on that show you know he sat down and said oh i wish i could just stay for the for the night because it was a, a matinee show so it was in the afternoon that show right and yeah, yeah. uh i remember him sat and said oh i sort of wish i could just sit and have a drink with you at the bar and just like you know watch the gig that's on this evening and i said oh i'd love to have you do that he said well i can't because i've got to go and see noel gallagher and play a gig in in some arena with him yeah. to like a hundred thousand people or something <laughs> and he was like yeah i'd just like to see the maze bar drinking but also i can't because i get mobbed by loads of young girls and yeah. it's like really sort of surreal sort of seeing this lad that I'd known at that point for sort of five or six years or whatever coming back and, and being in that situation but it was lovely you know it was lovely that he wanted to come and do that and we've been lucky enough to, to we were lucky enough to host some great artists over the years and to also see the progression of artists like Jake and, and mm. others uh, go from from playing open mics and being quite shy just learning their trade young men women to uh, to being people who were playing all over the country all over the world you know going on tv and radio and, and having very successful careers so you know it was i think that was the most rewarding thing in a lot of ways about about operating the venue and running a venue mm, no absolutely i think you know i think that's one of the things where it's such an important thing i feel having those local music venues yeah. in a music scene where it's supporting local music um, because, you know, you do have in, in most cities, you know, you've got your arenas, like larger music venues, yeah. which will put on like national touring acts, um, which, of course, is also equally important in its own way. But yeah. having those, you know, smaller independent grassroots music venues, because you need those places that are going to support the artists who are going to grow to that national level. Exactly, it's all sort of it's, it's 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 all an ecosystem, really. Like you know, like you say, it's important to have those venues where you can go and see the biggest bands in the world and see your favourite artist from the other side of the world or your, the biggest artist in the charts at the moment or whatever. But then it's also just as important that the the young young kids who are coming through and learning their trade for the first time get opportunities to play to people, make fans, showcase their music, and obviously. You know, something like I say, we we were lucky enough to enjoy the maze. Was seeing those artists go on to become those artists. So you know, seeing artists like you know, Ferocious Dog and Jake Bug and these people play at the maze to not a lot of people necessarily in their first gig to then later on be playing Rock City and the Arena and bigger, much bigger venues to sold out audiences five years down the line. And that's a, a beautiful thing. And I think that's an important thing in a city. And I think to be honest, when you look at any city that's had that sort of reputation as a good music city at any period in time, be it Manchester or Liverpool or London or wherever I, I think that, that those cities always have that they always have yeah they will have a nice arena and a nice big venue and you know big events going on but they'll also have your little dive bars and your little small venues your toilet venues your your little sort of hubs where things are happening creative places where things are going on and that's what makes the city really vibrant having that both ends of the scale sort of thing I think mm, absolutely you know. yeah no I couldn't couldn't agree more um and i mean I, I don't know how how do you feel kind of currently uh with the local music scene because i feel like we are kind of missing you know we don't have a lot of the venues that we used to have like the maze yeah. uh junction seven venues like that i mean you are at the moment um as a promoter you know you're putting on um obviously despite the current current global well, situation yeah, but doing some, yeah. yeah doing what you can you know you're doing stuff at the the old cold store um yeah. that venue in town uh which is another music venue um in nottingham uh, part of a, a pub basically but um yeah another local venue um you've been putting on outdoor events there but yeah. are covid friendly um i mean it's hard at the moment because of covid i think but I, I do think we sort of I think that a lot of venues sort of have disappeared from Nottingham over the last five years and, and then that, that has a knock on effect. You know, 10 years ago, there was Nottingham bands every week that were getting into NME and getting on to Radio 1 and, you know, all the time it seemed like Nottingham had a new new artist that was drawing attention on a national scale. And there was a real buzz around Nottingham for a while. It feels like that wave sort of maybe sort of settled a little bit now, but there's still a lot of talent in the city and there's still a lot of artists who are doing really well. Um, mm. And I still think that that it's still there's a lot of people still working hard behind the scenes and obviously covid doesn't help anything you know at the end of the day covid's basically put everything on hold hasn't it you know no one's been able to play many gigs most of the venues that are open haven't been open properly or been able to put on gigs mm. um you know studios haven't been open people haven't been able to record people haven't been able to write and, and produce the music in the way that we normally would um so you know hopefully over the next six months and year and stuff we'll see see some of that coming back and uh, like you 
you say, you know, I mean, I'm working at the old cold store now, but that was a venue that we started working on after the maze, but we never really got properly into it because we, it, COVID hit just as we we're sort of getting things going. Um, and I know there's a few other venues in town that, that have had refurbs and been doing stuff up and been try, trying to get off the ground, but sort of COVID's put a damper on it. So I'm hoping that, you know, we'll come out of COVID in a year's time, be able to look at Nottingham and go, yeah, Nottingham's got some great underground venues, some great small venues that are giving opportunities, some great promoters, you know, people like Will from I'm Not From London and various mm-hmm of us who have always supported local local artists and up and coming artists in the city and and we'll see we'll see a resurgence and another wave of great artists coming out of Nottingham that would be my hope um, and obviously you know people like ourselves will keep working to support those people um, mm. but you know it's it's hard to know coming out of Covid how what the landscape's going to be like because obviously a lot of people it's been very hard over the last year with mm. such a lack of work and stuff yeah no absolutely it really has you know I think everyone can can agree on that. Um, mm. I feel like it's kind of going to... Um, it could go either way, but I, I feel like just seeing how how people <coughs> have uh, been responding to the whole situation, you know, a lot of people have kind of taken it as an opportunity to yeah. sort of reassess and, and rebuild. And I think, I hope coming out of this that, um, you know, a lot of venues given that they've had the appropriate funding, which whilst a lot of the funding hasn't been great, there has at least been some level of support there. And, and you know, but I think the ones that survive this are hopefully going to come out uh, alive and kicking, you know. I think so. I think I think there's been a, a, a lot of people, like you say, who've reassessed what they're doing. I know I've done that, you know. I've sort of gone back to, to the roots of it in a lot of ways, you know. I've sort of gone, yeah, actually, I know what I've sort of recognised my strengths and gone, yeah, this is what we built the maze reputation on and that's what I want to get back to. And I've spoke to a lot of promoters and bands and musicians in the last few months since sort of regulation started easing and the prospect of getting back to some sort of normality and gigs and stuff. And and I think a lot of people are sort of in a place now where hopefully they can push on in, in, in different directions and work together. And I think people are, are really eager to sort of get things running again, but in the right ways maybe. And so I, I sort of feel hopeful that... that coming out of covid there might actually be a better scene come out of it in some ways as well so Mm. you know it'll be interesting to see it's a very interesting time in general to be alive but certainly if you're working with the in the events and music industry i think it is an interesting time you know there's been a lot a lot of change over the last few years and like you say with with the the rug being pulled out from underneath a lot of us it's sort of it tests you doesn't it and Mm. you either come out fighting or you or you go down in a in a in a a wreckage you know so Mm. it'll be interesting to see where where everything where the dust settles a little bit yeah no absolutely and yeah i think you know i think you're right i think the ones that do fight through this you know they will come out stronger and Mm. I, i think i think people just generally um yeah, sure, there's going to be some level of apprehension, I'm sure, for a lot of people, you know, getting back to normality, which people are slowly starting to, but, you know, just, just going out to gigs more into live music events. But I, I think people, you know, people are going to be eager to get back to that normality, particularly, yeah. you know, like the regular gig goers and stuff. So I think, we, sh- you know, we will see a lot of support. I think that's often the case whenever you kind of have any sort of industry uh or like economical crash um you know quite often coming out of it you 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 know you see a big resurgence in yeah you see a unity i think it brings people together in a weird way and i think with the gig thing as well i think i think people will be surprised a little bit like i think people don't necessarily realize how important music can be and um, I mean, I was talking to my mum yesterday when I'd see, and she came to the gig that I put on last weekend, and it was the first time she'd been to a gig in, like, you know, well over a year probably uh, since mm. first lockdown. So, you know, it'd been more than a year since she'd been and seen live music. And she just said, like, and she's not somebody who goes to gigs massively regularly. You know, she goes to, she'll come and see my band play sometimes, and she'll go to other little gigs that she likes occasionally, but she's not a, what I'd call a regular gig goer necessarily. But she said, you know, going and seeing live music in an environment when she felt safe she was she said it was quite anxious about it initially but mm. when she was there and she heard music and she saw those faces and she 
experience that connection you get it was overwhelming almost and i think a lot of people have sort of said that to me in the last couple of weeks when we have been putting on these events that we've started being able to do now and i think as we come out of this there'll be a sort of new love for music and appreciation for it maybe as well because i think people have just got used to the privilege of being able to go especially in nottingham you know we're, we're very lucky in Nottingham, but there is a lot of music that goes on so you know i used to joke that you know you could on a saturday night you could literally pin 20 venues that would have music on you had such a variety of choice of where to go you could go to different clubs pubs bars in, in venues and see various types of bands and solo acts and djs and whatever and obviously we have hardly had any of that for now a year so i think mm. hopefully people will be more sort of appreciative of what a great privilege it is to be able to have that and also what good talent there is in the city and um and what good nights out there are in this city and and and, and enjoy it and hopefully that'll bring the economy back roaring and also help the the people involved in the industry to to rebuild again you know mm. no i think so yeah and i think that is that is a really key thing you know people do it's that classic thing of like you know you don't know what you've got until it's gone exactly. kind of thing yeah. and people people will you know i mean i remember the start of the uh the first lockdown mm. that we had in the uk um you know sort of thinking i think a lot of people have talked to felt the same you know i was like oh you know it's quite quite nice like the time off you yeah. know even though you were, re were restricted in what you could do um just having downtime and, and being able to slow down a bit yeah. was a really nice feeling but then once you know that that kind of wore off and, and the dust settled it you know it then uh i started to you know i was keen to just just do things yeah, and, and, and it, be productive think. yeah exactly and um and then yeah just with music and live music that emotional connection that people have and and we need you know we need the arts in our lives i think because the expression that it allows people you know music particularly is such a, a universal language yeah um and i think people really need that it enriches their lives well i think i think you know during these lockdowns we've had we've been disconnected from each other in so many ways, obviously not being able to see people as regularly, not being able to go out and, and, and interact in groups like we used to, you know, from going to, to bars and pubs and, and having a social life to, to even just going to see family and friends in their houses and stuff. You know, it all got took away. But like you say, music's a universal language. And actually, the, the gigs I've been to so far, it's been quite emotional just because suddenly there is this connection with people, not necessarily people you're that close to or know, but just through the, the language of music and the expression of music, feeling that connection, which before I never really thought about it too much because it was just something that I did every night, every day. It was always going on. And, and then now suddenly it's something that's actually a new thing for me a little bit because I've got used to not having it. And I think as, as we come out of this lockdown, it's going to surprise people a bit how how much that overwhelms them almost as, as they start going back to gigs. And, and it's going to be overwhelming because we've all had such a connections, distant connections, but I think it can be a beautiful thing, you know. I, I, really, I think it, it could be a really exciting thing as well because I think people will reconnect and it can be lovely. So I'm excited about what the next next six months holds as we come out of lockdown and we start being able to socialise again and also go out and uh, and listen to music again. Mm, no absolutely and yeah. i'm sure there's loads of bands that have written loads of great new songs in lockdown as well because that's yeah. another thing i think a lot of musicians have had a chance to do is sort of sit down and, and think about writing again which isn't something you necessarily always get to do when you've got gigs every weekend and a job on the side and etc cetera, etc cetera. so you mm. know i'm sure that there will be uh out of this hardship of lockdown there'll be a lot of a positive music that comes out of that as well i know i know many artists that have sort of got albums ready to go sort of thing mm. so you know i think it could be a really exciting time for music in the coming years as we come out of this time hopefully yeah no definitely um you know plenty of bands i know um have, have been writing a lot of stuff and um you know also just kind of i think with the extra time to really look at what they're doing and you know not being out there gigging all the time and yeah, stuff yeah. like sort of reevaluate a little yeah, bit. yeah exactly um and you know i mean I, I would say um for for your band um unknown era you know because mm. you guys 
have been rehearsing here yeah. and hearing what you guys are doing also with the you've been writing your own solo stuff yeah uh, which is you know a new thing for you yeah i mean that's um, something that i hadn't done for a long long time really it'd been probably close to 10 years since i've really put any time into my solo projects mm. um it's all been you know my focus had always been on band and on on, on my businesses and my and my other my other parts of my life um but i spent quite a lot of time in lockdown getting to grips with we've sort of reinventing my solo sound and, and that and that's been really fun uh, both as from a personal point of view and i'm excited to see what other people think of it as well so you know in my from a personal point of view yeah i can definitely see that for me but i think you know like you say a lot of people have done that and you know i've seen a lot of bands that seem to have reformed as well though for mm. lockdown and gone you know what i know we all had a big argument two years ago but actually i really miss playing with you guys let's make it up and get back on the ball you know and that's lovely to see as well yeah yeah no absolutely yeah um yeah and i mean you know for for your band so again for the viewers um gaz plays in a band called unknown era um they are uh uh, uh well primarily ska like ska reggae yeah kind of band. yeah yeah, yeah so i'd say part, primarily party band ska reggae. Kinda. yeah yeah we've got a lot of influences i guess we mix yeah. it up between a lot of things but yeah primarily i'd say i guess we're a ska band or a ska reggae band yeah mm. um but with lots of members and we change up occasionally and do have throw in the odd funk song and the odd hip-hop song and stuff so yeah yeah <laughs> there's always the odd surprise in there mm, no definitely yeah and that that was one thing i was going to say you know um you you've sort of had a fair fair amount of I, I think the core of your band um m you know member wise has, has always mm. sort of stayed the same but you've had a fair amount of lineup changes and yeah. so i think i think i can imagine for you guys you know right now again having the extra downtime um and and not being out there playing gigs and you know being able to fo focus on rehearsal a bit more now but that's sort of able to be a thing yeah i mean it's it, with the band it's been a really weird experience i think because the band was all hyped up for all, we, you know, we had an album coming out and we had a, quite a lot of gigs planned, touring planned. We had Europe dates and UK dates and loads of festivals sort of in 2019. And I'd have, I'd, I'd have health problems just before that. So also we'd already had a little bit of downtime while I was recovering from my health issues. So we were all sort of piped up for all that. And then along came lockdown and COVID and everything got cancelled. But we'd also, like you say, had had some lineup changes in that sort of six months. So it has given us a chance to sort of sell a new lineup in and to get them up to speed and start uh, writing some new material. We wrote three songs in lockdown, released three songs during lockdown. Um, and we've got quite a lot of other ideas on the go. And there's a few new directions that we're trying out and new ideas with the new members bringing their influences, obviously, too. Um, so it has been nice for that. But on the other side of the coin, it's also been sort of frustrating having all these great opportunities that were meant to happen that have been get pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And at the moment, we sort of don't know if some of these things are going to happen, if they're not. So it's sort of, I think we had a, a very sort of set route that we were planning to go on and we sort of could I, could I could sit down in in january february 2019 and go yeah i expect the band to do this this and this over the next 12 months and then pretty much 90 percent of that 95 percent of that didn't happen due to covid so mm. now it's sort of like is that going to happen or but obviously everyone's moved on a bit and people have changed and we've had members come and go a little bit and we've had uh, you know quite a few of the members have changed where they are in their lives as far as jobs is concerned so um, you know max our, our trombone player is now running this studio with you running yeah. labyrinth studios with you uh, which he wasn't doing pre-covid you know mm. and i've got a new job uh, now in my day job and so have quite a few of the other members so so it's changed our targets maybe and the route we're on has changed a little bit and so i mean but i i, I see all of that as an exciting journey and as part of the journey really but but it, you know it shows what covid has done for a lot of people it's really sort of changed the goalposts a bit and you've had to react and 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 retrain and replan and refocus a bit and yeah on one side of the coin it's been quite nice to sort of do that on the other side of the coin it's been very challenging to do that i think and frustrating mm. at times but it is what it is I think everyone in, is in the same boat, certainly in the in the certain in this industry and in, in events and music and stuff. Everyone's had to adjust. You know, I've got so many friends from various various walks of the the music industry background who've had to completely adjust their life, and and it's gone on hold for so many of us. So. Mm. You know, I, I think the nice feeling, again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, is there's some sort of unity there of everyone's been in through the same sort of horrible 
tough year that's they've had, where they've had to but on the flip side everyone's been able to reevaluate a bit and go yeah actually I've always wanted to do this maybe this is the time to start doing this and from mm-hmm. now on actually I'm not going to waste my time on this a person or this thing or this whatever anymore I'm going to just concentrate on these things that make me happy and so I think we're probably long term all going to come out of this in more positive places I think but yeah. short term it's been a pretty tough year for a lot of people but uh, mm. you know that's life isn't it so yeah. you know as long yeah. as we're in it together <laughs> yeah yeah and I think I think that is a key thing you know being in it together mm. and um, you know it is a very humbling thing when you're kind of all put on that level playing field yeah. it's very unifying in that sense um, yeah definitely mm, um yeah and i i've I've loved seeing some of the um within the music world some of the creativity that's come out of the sort of restrictions that we've Mm. had i mean for for unknown era um for oh which track was it It was the music video you did um there might be more than one actually but you did it all remotely essentially where all of your yeah i mean first lockdown we had a lot of fun with that and it was Mm. great because that was something we'd never had to do before we probably never would have done but now looking back at it i go it's great you know we did we did the misfit video was all remote we also recorded a couple of tracks where we did them remotely from home you know Mm. i went out and had to go and buy some equipment and so did some of the other members but you know we managed to do it and and max mixed it from his house and you know before you'd set up the studio and Mm. and that was a great experience in a lot of ways and something we'd never done before and you know we've done we've done a few live streams and stuff which is again a weird experience playing we did one at metronome in nottingham last christmas which was a very weird experience sort of sat in a in a big venue with just us and a couple of cameramen and sound men and you know basically there was more band members than there was audience as such (laughs) But, you know, like uh, quite a lot, a few hundred people watched that live at the time and then it went out on YouTube afterwards and I I don't know how many views it's had now, but, you know, it was was nice to do that. And that was, you know, that was our last gig as such, you know, and that's Mm. back at Christmas sort of eight months ago now nearly, seven months ago. So... You know, it's 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 been an interesting year, and I think, like you say, it's been nice because there have been new skills that have been adopted and new ideas, and I think we can take that onwards. You know, things like doing streams and recording remote, remotely, practicing remotely, writing remotely is all something actually that, even though it was forced upon us a little bit, actually I think long term it can be a benefit to us in many ways, and I think there's mm. there's there's a lot of things like that. You know, with the promoting as well, you know we had to adapt to putting on socially distanced gigs and stuff. But actually, I've really enjoyed some of the socially distanced gigs. They've got a very different vibe, but they've been but they've been lovely in some ways. And mm. I think I will do more seated shows in future because there's something about them that actually works really well if it's the right sort of music in the right sort of environment. So mm. I think in anything, as with anything in life, it's all about making sure you take the positives from it. And I think there are positives to come out of this. There's a lot of people who've done some really good stuff and really creative stuff. You know, I've seen amazing music videos from amazing projects that have come out of lockdown um, and come out of these difficult times. And going forward, hopefully we can um, keep that idea going and keep that 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 sort of ethos going mm. um, to, to make some really interesting music and to support each other more, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and a few people have kind of talked with this sort of stuff about um, a lot of people have had the kind of mindset that whether it's, you know, bands doing live streaming, uh, doing remote recording or socially distant shows, any of those, you know, these things that have been forced upon us, like you say, um, whether that, you know, it's it's that replaces mm. how things were before. Or, you know, we just go back to how where we were before. And I think it'll be it, a mix. Yeah, that's it. It doesn't have to be replace. one or the other. Mm. I, I think so. Like, I mean, I've, I I really have enjoyed doing some of the live streams. But, you know, we did before we'd do music videos, but now you can do a live stream and that can be instead of a music video maybe or alongside. It's just another promotional tool that we maybe didn't really see the extent of how good it can be. Because at the end of the day, you know, we can play a million gigs in the UK a year to our UK audience. But if we've got one fan in australia you know and we've had people from australia and america and you know all over the place hundreds of miles away contact us via facebook and email and social media and whatever and say i really like your music i'm going to buy your 
your tracks on Bandcamp or I listen to you on Spotify or whatever, but they can't come to a gig because we're not a big band that's going to be touring the world. We're not mm. a band that's going to be able to do that. But with live streaming, they can feel like they're at a gig. It's the closest they can get. And, you know, there's a whole, it's, it opens up to different audiences and it's, it can be used as a tool, these things. And the same with the remote, you know, there's bands that go, oh, you know, we all lived in the same area of the country for five years and we had a great band going on and we were gigging and practicing every week but then suddenly two of us have had to move to the other side of the country so let's just call it quits but now Mm. actually having been through this it's like well when we were in lockdown we all couldn't see each other but we recorded remotely there's no reason why this band has to split up if we still enjoy it why don't we just do it remotely and this is something that i think people just didn't think about before but now it could be used still even if we do go back to potentially a position where we can go back to doing in-person gigs in-person rehearsals and all these things there's no reason why we can't still uh, use the skills we've learned in lockdown and the the, the things we've come up with in lockdown to to keep going mm. uh, as tools to to widen our audience and to make life easier uh, and 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 continue to do stuff you know I think one thing that a lot of people have discovered in lockdown was how busy their life would be and how nice it is to actually, like you said earlier, slow down a bit and sort of take a bit more time over things and, and have a bit of a break to sort of reevaluate and think things through. But I also think, what's the point in all that? Then we just go back to our busy life and forget all these lessons that we've learned. So mm. I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, for me, I really hope that, I, I I keep taking my time over stuff coming out of lockdown. I want to go back to doing plenty of gigs and stuff, but I don't want to feel pressure to, to do more than what I'm happy with doing. And also still being able to use the skills that I learned in lockdown as far as doing things from a more remote thing where I don't have to be face-to-face and face-fronting and always in meetings and stuff and be able to do that stuff with, so to, keep, to release that pressure so I don't have to feel like I'm on the go as much because, mm. I mean, for me, I have blood pressure issues. I don't need to have that stress in my life anymore, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and I don't think any of us do, you know? I think there's a lot of people that realised how stressful life was a bit when they were... When, and it, was like, it took it took lockdown and some time away from, from life to realise that a little bit, so, mm. you know, I think... I, I hope the lockdown... Is a is I hope it's over for a start. I hope mm. it is over sooner rather than later. But I hope it's something that we look back on as 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 something where we learnt a lot and something where we actually now appreciate things like music and socialising and each other a lot more coming out of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, for for me, one of the biggest things that I have loved, which I never thought I would do, um, about you know what has come out of of uh the pandemic is video calls um yeah i i i always thought the you know the idea to me was kind of just a bit absurd mm. um but now now i've come to realize that like because you're saying about you know having meetings and stuff with people it's like you don't you don't need to kind of go somewhere to meet people all the time no when we have the ability to you know yeah. we can just hop on a video call with people and it does mean that because modern living is very fast paced and busy for most people. So, you know, if we can make our lives easier rather than, uh, you know, everybody. Well, it, rather than getting up at seven o'clock yeah. to go and drive across the city to get to a meeting at nine, you can just have an extra hour in bed or an extra hour doing something productive, something else productive or, you know, cleaning your house up or cooking or doing something that's actually healthy um, for for your mental and physical well-being, and then just hop on a video call 10 minutes before, you know, you're there rather than having to go into the office every day or go to a meeting every day. And, you know, and I, I, I also, I, I wasn't a big fan of video calls at all before lockdown. And I still wouldn't say I'm a massive fan of them always, but certainly for very personal calls, I like them too, because one thing that used to really annoy me when I worked at the maze was the amount of things when you're doing a lot of stuff via email and social media messaging and text messaging and stuff is that the problem with, with communicating through written word is that it's hard to express emotion sometimes. And I used to find it, especially when I was doing stuff like uh, talking to promoters and bands about about loading. And I, you know, I was trying to be matter of fact with them saying, you know, this, this can't be done because this would put too much pressure on the staff at the venue or you have to abide to our times and people get upset. And then when I talked to them in person, they'd be like, fine with it because they could see on my face that it wasn't that I was being 
being rude to them for no reason. It was just that I was trying to make sure I protected everyone involved in the in the in the process and and made sure that everything was done in a way so that everyone was treated fairly and. Mm. And, and actually, especially, you know, and again, uh, in a band, it happens all the time when when you're messaging each other, people get the wrong end of the stick about things and start like sort of going, oh, well, why are you, are you angry at me? And it's like, I'm not angry at you. I'm just asking a question. Don't get yeah. upset. But, you know, it happens all the time. Whereas video calls, you can see the other person. So you can see if they're upset. You can see if they're feeling angry at you. You can see if they're happy. You can see if they're joking. You can see if they're being sarcastic. You know, you can see all mm. these things. So actually, video calling is a great thing. And, and you know, we've got this technology why don't we use it i don't think we used a lot of the technology that we had to its greatest potential pre-lockdown but there's certain things certainly like you say like video calling and streaming and and in, and the internet that we mm. actually use for communicating now a lot better due to lockdown um and i think that you know that is certainly i'm pretty sure going to continue i think there's going to be a lot of people who use video conferencing more and more now and don't bother with going having meetings at offices and, and, mm. and out and about because like you say it just saves time it, it's a no-brainer almost really <laughs> yeah yeah no it really is um yeah, I know. It's funny you say, because I think you're so right about uh, text communication, um, you know, any communication where it's by written words, so email, mm. text, Facebook messages, whatever. Um, I I used to, as head engineer um, at a couple of different music venues, um, so yeah, when I was working in live sound a lot more, be- sort of pre-studio, um, it took me years to really get to grasp... Uh, get to grips with it and just being good at writing emails in a way where yeah people didn't when there was kind of something um that needed like negotiating or you just had to be like firm about certain things um yeah i would always come across as angry yeah um and and it took me a long time to sort of really get a handle on that um because for a long time i was like why do people always kind of read me the wrong way and and, um and (laughs) you know it was something it took me a long time to get the hang of and get good at um and and there certainly is a way to you know to write emails and things and come across in the best way possible but even then it, it's you know it just is a very inefficient form of communication it is because people also put their mood upon something so if you've had a bad day and you're in a bad mood anyway and then you read an email that says uh, next time you come into the, the venue make sure you turn this light off or something you know people are going oh well i'm in a bad mood anyway why are they having a go at me and it's not that you were just asking them nicely in your head mm. you know <clears throat> and this is uh and this is a great thing about video calls I remember for years I started just putting kisses on the end of every text message I ever wrote, even if it was professional. Mm. And people, a few people said to me, why do you always put kisses? And I was like, so they know that I love them because yeah. people think that I'm angry at them. So if I put a kiss at the end, they know that I love them. But then I started getting a bit weird when I started putting kisses to like really professional yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, right into my local EP kiss, kiss at the end. It wasn't the best idea. No. Um, but you know, video calls is great for that. And we've got the technology now. Everyone's got a great a great video camera slash uh, camera in on in their pocket in their phone you know 99 percent of people mm. why not use these things yeah you know, everyone's got the option to video call everyone's got the option to to get out there to a, such a big audience now with the the way the internet is and the amount of platforms that are out there there's an app for absolutely everything you can think of almost you know so i think lockdown's given people a chance to a understand how much there is how many things how many tools there are out there uh, to use and also it's given the people a chance to actually learn to use some of this stuff better which again you know when you're working a full-time job and you've got various hobbies and a social life and you know as a musician you're in a band and you're doing this in your spare time you don't always have time to sit down and figure out how to use every social media platform and every phone app and how to do all these things so i think you know having this time downtime has been good for that as well it's given people a chance to actually learn how to to use things a bit better as well as uh, giving people a chance to actually get back to doing the things that they enjoy a bit more when it comes to their music careers mm, no definitely um yeah going back to uh was just when we were talking about you know sort of communicating by messages and stuff mm. and you were talking it uh, about how the maze you know just dealing with whether it's like promoters or, or artists or yeah. artist management or whatever um 
yeah, I'm just quite interested, kind of primarily for anybody who was looking at getting into um, whether it's promoting or, or running their own music venue, just kind of, um, I guess, maybe what was like a, a typical day in the life for you running a venue, <laughs> some of the stresses, you know, some of the challenges that were there. Yeah, I mean... It was weird because it was different every day, I guess, really. But I mean, I guess an average day would consist of, I mean, the hours were insane. I mean, I think one of the things that I definitely don't want to ever get back into was those sort of crazy hours because it was pretty much being on call 24-7, really. You know, when you were in in any pub or venue um, of any sort that's open seven days a week, then it's hard to get time off because obviously if you get a call saying we've got a problem with the be a problem with the electricity or you know something's happened then you're gonna have to go in and sort it out 90 percent of the time um so that's always a thing but in a music venue as well there's so many more problems because you've not just got the bar side and the staff side to think about but you've also got the promotion of all the events to think about and the sound and the maintenance of all the equipment to think about so there was there was a lot of jobs and trying to keep that all i mean I said it in an interview recently that I had for a job, which is, you know, I'm a very organised person now due to the maze because I have to write everything down to make sure I remember everything because at the maze, I would not have been able to remember to do everything. So, you know, mm. I'd make sure that I had monthly jobs that I did at set times. But my, my average day at the maze would be, I would get up fairly early, maybe between, well, it would depend a little bit on how late the night before had been. But uh, generally I'd be up between sort of 8am and 11am and I'd get in the office answering emails replying to agents filling in the diary checking a the diary then emailing back to bands and agents and promoters to make sure that things were confirmed for that month and that week um, then contacting staff to make sure voters were up to date and that people knew when they were coming in then I'll generally go for a walk around the venue, make sure that there was no maintenance issues, make sure light bulbs were in, make sure the sound system was working, that people had closed down properly the night before and that things had been turned off, um, make sure my cellar had been kept up to date and all the beer was good and no, nothing needed doing down there and obviously then problem solving any of that if it was... And then getting ready for opening and then once you open, it was a matter of of keeping the bar going, keeping the sound going and hosting at the same time, really, and sort of juggling the three. And obviously a lot of it was about having a good staff team around you and making sure you had the right people that that you could trust to sort of do their end of it. And and as a general manager, your job really is is managing all of those people and making Mm. sure that everyone's involved. But I mean, for anybody sort of looking to get into that, I think the big thing is actually not to be scared. Like, when I, I was very tentative when I first started doing it. I didn't have much self-belief. Um, but actually, a lot of it is just being the person that is there. So, you know, making sure that when things go wrong, you're there to pick up the pieces, making sure that you are the one that is following up on everything. And and I think that's what makes a good manager is communication is the biggest part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the biggest things about it. And that goes for, you know... Even with networking, you know, it's the same thing, really, you know. I mean, I spent a lot of time, you know, when we first started the maze, I would work at the maze four or five nights a week, and the other two nights I had off, three nights I had off, I would be out at other gigs, meeting people, watching bands, chatting to those bands, chatting to the managers of those bands, chatting to the promoters of those gigs and seeing if we could do collaborations or if they wanted to come and do something at the maze. You know, there was a lot of years spent networking, which was really fun. It probably wasn't great for my liver, but, you know, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, and, and you know, it all comes around, you know, I, it sort of sounds naughty a bit, but, you know, it's very rare these days that I pay to get into any event in Nottingham because I generally know somebody who always offers me a ticket and, you mm. know, and that's a nice thing. I, I try and pay for stuff, obviously, if it's charity things and stuff. Uh, and I, I'll try, I always try and support bands I like still by buying their merch and things. But but it's 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 a, ni- it's a family, really, in the music scene. It is an extended family, I think, and, and that's something I feel very lucky to have been part of. But it is about just sort of being there. And, you know, most of the people I employed at the maze over the years were people that didn't get the job because they necessarily had the most experience or the best CV. It was people who who had a passion for coming out and supporting the venue and supporting the artists and, and, you know, people I'd got to know because they were coming down to the gigs regularly and showing an interest in the sound or an interest in the bar or an interest in promoting. And I was like, you know, if you're interested, 
come and help us out and you know help us out a couple of times and if i've got someone at work for you i'll pay you to come and help us out and then mm. if, if you're good at that i'll give you a full-time job coming to help us out you know and that's how it happened for a lot of things at the maze it was a very organic process i think um and i mean i don't know if it i think that's probably the same to some extent in a lot of places and i think maybe it's not in some places but for me i've never thought of myself as somebody who was massively talented at anything they've done really as far as music goes or promotion goes or whatever i'm just someone who's really determined and has a real passion for it and will keep going and going back and making friends and 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 making i'm sure people know who i am and and want to work with me and i think i've done a pretty good job of that hopefully Mm, (laughs) and and it's certainly been a lot of fun (laughs) Mm. yeah no i mean yeah i think i think you've done an excellent job you know in everything you've done um as a musician promoter you know music venue operator as a lot on, oh, thanks, on the scene <laughs> yeah anytime um yeah no i mean that's why i kind of wanted to have this conversation because i think you're such a great example to anyone wanting to get out there in any of those kind of capacities um and and it's really interesting you say because i kind of wholeheartedly agree i think it's very much about just getting yourself out there being present and making yourself known because it doesn't really matter like how good you are at anything the thing is you pick these things up and if you've got a passion Mm. for it you'll get good at it you know like i've I've dabbled in so many things that when it comes to the music industry like i say i I started out in journalism and i've i've done bits of sound engineering and i've done bits of obviously been in bands and but it, it sort of helps the more things you do the more understanding you can have with other people you work with and uh, but it is about about being there. I mean, I think one of the biggest things in the music industry is is that it like we like I said earlier, running the venue is obviously twenty four seven. But actually, the whole industry is twenty four seven. You know, you aren't mm-hmm. going to be working a nine to five if you're in the music industry because gigs tend to take place at crazy times of night and pack downs tend to take place for hours afterwards and hours before. And generally, there's not many people in the music industry that manage to get to work a nine to five. Um, mm. But if you've got a passion for it, it doesn't really feel like work. It's also quite fun. And so there's an, an, a, it's a mixture of work and fun. So it is a nice sort of uh, counterbalance to it. Um but it is about being there and it's about being committed to it and you know it is tiring you know and and one thing lockdown gave me was a realization that i still wanted to do it because at one point i wasn't really sure after the maze i was sort of like have i come to a point where i don't want to be involved in the music industry maybe i'll just go and retrain especially when covid hit and the government was telling everyone to retrain Mm -hmm. i was sort of like maybe i should retrain maybe it's time for me to retrain but then actually the more i thought about it once i picked my guitar up a few times and spoke to a few people and watched a few podcasts and uh, you know checked a few things out i was like no actually this is exactly where i want to be i just need to rethink the way i'm doing things and find a new role for myself within mm-hmm. nottingham's music scene um and and i think i'm hopefully finding that at the moment and it's exciting at the moment for, i think there's good things going to happen in the next few years hopefully uh, for myself and for, for others who uh, i'm involved with so you know it's all it's all about getting out there and enjoying it you know and so if, if you've got a passion for music if you've got a passion for putting on events if you've got a passion for for working with musicians be it in sound engineering roadie and set up to, set design whatever you know then i think the big thing is just getting out there and meeting people you don't have to have all the qualifications in the world you don't have to you know if you can get them great but it's it's more about being there like you say yeah yeah definitely you know i mean yeah i i would say like the majority of the work that i've gotten over the years as a sound engineer uh and a, as a musician as well um has just been through people I know and like through association. Yeah. And, I mean, it's the old having... cliche if it's mm. about who you know, but it, it is in the industry, yeah. in the music industry a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, it is. I mean, obviously it helps when you've studied hard and, and you know your ins and outs, obviously, but there's ways of doing that. You can go to college and do that and university and do that and, and really get the understand, ins and outs understanding of all the technical side, be it music theory or be it engineering theory, when it comes to, to uh, you know, whatever line of work you're going into in the industry. But you still have to be there. You're never going to just get a job because you've got a great understanding of how a desk works or your great understanding of how to set up a gig or, you know, you're a great guitarist. You're not going to necessarily get work just for those things. You need to also be passionate and be present and be dedicated to what jobs you're doing. And Mm -hmm. also, if you do all that, 
and it doesn't actually necessarily matter as much about the the technical aspect sometimes because actually the big thing is you're there and you're taking responsibility for for the role to make sure that the show happens you know feels like we're just talking in cliches now the show must go on and all that you know (laughs) but yeah you know it's true and yeah and yeah you know it it is so much of it, it it just is being there and getting yourself out there and it it doesn't really matter how good you know like relating to me as a sound engineer like how good i am as a sound engineer unless i actually go out there and do it because you could train as much as you like in something but until you've actually gone out there and gotten that real world experience Mm. and proven yourself in that way not just to yourself but other people because most people in the industry they'll be willing to give somebody that first chance yeah so there's always that element of like if you can just have enough self-confidence to get out there and and maybe kind of wing it a little bit yeah but if you can do that and follow through yeah and there's always a wing in it is another massive thing because there's so many issues that problem solving is a massive part of any job in the industry i think to some extent because there's always things that suddenly jump up you can be as prepared as anything and suddenly the weather means that people aren't going to come to your gig or an amp blows and you're suddenly going to have to figure a route round to make sure the sound happens without this amp that you were relying on. You know, there's there's a massive element of being able to work well under pressure and sort of just wing it a bit and get through it. And also teamwork, you know, one of the biggest things is, you know, it doesn't matter how good a sound, sound engineer you've got, if the band aren't professional and haven't got good equipment, they're never going to sound as good. Mm. And, say, and the other way around as well, you know, you can have the greatest band in the world, but if the sound engineer isn't working with the band properly they're never going to sound as good you can have the greatest band in the world that have got massive following if the promoter doesn't know how to put the gig on then there's no one's going to turn up and it's not going to be a great gig so you know it's all about teamwork as well and you're only as good as the team around you and that was something that I always tried to put into my staff at the maze a lot was was the idea that it wasn't about me it wasn't about my partner Steph and my partner my business partner Ben it wasn't about one person or two people it was about the whole team and the event's never going to happen unless the whole team from from the toilet cleaner to the lead singer of the band everyone has to pull their weight and has to be pulling in the same direction of we're going to put on a great show tonight and it's going to really work and we're going to make it so it's busy and the, the paying customer has a great time and everyone has to work together so you know it it is it's about being there it's about being able to be dedicated and to wing it and to be patient and calm in situations but it's also about everybody doing that and when all that comes together it's a great feeling because you just it's easy as well it becomes a lot easier when everyone's pulling from that same thing um, mm. and I, I, for me there's no feeling like it really I, so i get a massive amount of satisfaction when I am involved in a show, be it as a musician or as a promoter or even as an audience member to some extent, where I'm involved in a show and I'm stood watching that band play on their last encore or something and I look around and think everyone in this room is having a really lovely time and everyone who's working here is enjoying their job and this is a great night and anybody who's reviewing this for a magazine right now will be writing good positive things. I get a massive amount of satisfaction out of that knowing that that I've been a cog in that wheel, you know, mm. and I think that's that's a big thing in the music industry is the sort of satisfaction of all coming together to to provide a, a entertainment and and an art form that is always a one off as well because every gig is a unique experience mm. in its own way. Yeah, yeah, it really is, and yeah, it's one of the things that I always, you know, I think that drew me to live sound engineering because um, I I loved kind of feeling like I was a part of sort of facilitating something for um you know I guess both the audience and whatever band whatever musicians were playing but being part of that ecosystem because it feels like something that is sort of less self-serving like yeah of course yeah you know you get some satisfaction but but yeah it, it is about being feeling like a part of something that's bigger bigger than yourself the most satisfying moments for me at the maze over the 15 odd years i was there there were two things that i really got greater satisfaction from one was from seeing people who i had met when they were sort of not confident and down and out a bit and and didn't know what they wanted to do and then giving them opportunities and seeing them grow and progress into people who were so 
very accomplished at what they did and being able to look and go, wow, they've completely outdone anything I ever thought they would. But I know I was a little part of giving them that bit of self-confidence and that bit of training to sort of get them on that right road. That, and the other thing that I absolutely cannot put into words how satisfying it is, is when people come up to me and say, I went to a gig that you put on that changed my life. You know, I had people who got proposed to at gigs in the maze and came back years later and said, yeah, my husband proposed to me at that gig. And I was like, I put that gig on. They were like, yeah, if it wasn't for you, I would not be married to my husband or I, or I met my partner who I've been with for 10 years or this amazing moment. I met my best friend or I met my, you know, or something like that. Or I had one of my most memorable nights out ever, you know, and that is something that you can't really the place it's a it's an amazing feeling to know that you've made other people happy people you don't even necessarily know because we don't you don't do it for self-glory really yet yeah, i i like putting bands on and i'll put on bands that i like generally i'm not going to put on a band that i really hate mm. but you don't sort of think about that when you first start promoting is the fact that actually there's loads of people out there you don't even know who also connect with you on a level because they like the similar music or they like that band or that artist or they like the, the nights out that you like and the atmosphere that is produced in that venue and and it's an amazing thing to sort of feel that like you said the ecosystem and the connections as, as humans that we get with each other even if we're complete strangers and it's like this new job I started recently, I, there's about four people who work there that I hadn't met before who all had been to the maze. And when I told them that I used to run the maze, they were all like, oh, I love the maze. I love the maze. And it's amazing how often that happens to me now where mm. I mention to people that I ran the maze and they have a connection. These are people I, I've never met before, you know, and they're people, if I had met them before, a lot of them I'd probably be really good friends with. And, you know, there's friends that I've got now who when I first met them, I met them. And the reason they were drawn to me partly was because I, I worked at the maze a bit maybe. But actually we get on really well and it just shows how many connections we have as human beings. And like you said earlier, like music is a very connective expressive thing that that really connects us all i think and coming out of lockdown it certainly is something that i think will reconnect us all again mm, yeah no absolutely like yeah i i think so and um yeah i think i think kind of because we've talked a lot about the the sort of positives of working in um you know the live music industry mm. um one of the things that we kind of have touched on which i think is an interesting point and something I've discussed a lot with other people, um, myself and Sam Heaton from the band Air Lou, who, yeah. who was on the last podcast episode. Yeah, and I love we Sam. kind of, yeah, <laughs> Sam's a great guy. <laughs> Lovely guy. Yeah. And we talked about this a bit. Um, you know, just, just sort of the work ethic involved, and particularly for anybody in any kind of role in the live music industry uh, or events industry, I guess, as a whole if you're looking into getting into any of those lines of work, um, just, yeah, kind of being prepared to commit because it is one of those things you were saying earlier, you know, if you work in the music industry, you're very lucky if you could get a nine to five. Yeah. Um, and it's something, it's a weird one I think about a lot where there aren't many other career paths, like where if you've got a real passion for what you want to do and and you you know you're set on doing whatever it is you want to do in the music industry to be able to sort of reconcile that with the fact that because you might love you know putting on events you might love being a musician making music or being a sound engineer whatever it is um but you don't love like late night hours you know for whatever reason yeah, like, yeah, that yeah. doesn't gel with you and it, it's you know. I, I think that's that's a challenge that I'm sort of at now because for years I did love that. I loved staying up late drinking and had partying with the bands afterwards and all that. But I'm in my 40s now and I've had health issues that I have to think about and and it's I feel like I'm at an interesting crossroads with that now because actually as I, I still love people. I love socialising. I love chatting. I love, I love seeing the gigs. But actually the idea of staying up till four in the morning partying – is something that I will not, I'll be delegating to somebody else from now on. And it'll be interesting. I find it, I, I, there's part of me that's sort of a little anxious about how that's going to work and a part of me that's sort of excited to see how it'll work and how I can adapt to be a guy that still puts on great events, I hope, and is involved in those those events without having to be the guy that's the, the you know, I'll be the first one in, but I won't be the last one standing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's definitely ways you can sort of... Um, 
mitigate the strain you might put on yourself yeah i think i think it is it's such a thing for anyone going into the industry if you go in young and it's a lot easier if you're younger you yeah. know to to sort of indulge in the the rock and roll lifestyle, lifestyle sort of that thing, often yeah. comes with yeah. this industry um but then you do reach a point you can only do that for so you long you burn out after yeah. a while it is an industry where yeah. a lot of people burn out in because of that you know and it's another one i mean you know, I thought you might have got, were going to say, and, and another thing that I think about this and it's sort of unique in some ways is you do end up taking a lot of it home to some extent because it is a passion. So, you know, I do end up thinking about music when I'm at home because what do I do when I'm at home? I listen to music because I like music, you know, mm. and then I start thinking, oh, maybe I should put this band on again or maybe I should do this, you know. And so, you know, I think it is something that's, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure that's the case with a lot of people who are passionate about whatever job they do, but, but it is... It is an industry where you sort of pick up and drop out when when you need to, not necessarily when you're asked to. Um, and and there is a dedication that has to be there, but that is hard. And like you say, the older you get, the harder it becomes because you get other things in your life that become priority, and mm. you just haven't got the energy to do the crazy things you did before. And 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 drink and booze and drugs don't uh, don't help anymore. They hinder you, and so mm. you know it's all right when you're in your twenties. Just go, yeah, I'll have another, I'll have another whiskey and stay up another hour, and I'll do the cleaning first thing in the morning, and it's and the pack down later. But the older you get, the more that becomes like, no, I want to do the pack down right away. Make sure everything's not right, and make sure it's okay. And I don't want another whiskey because I've already had one, and that's enough. <laughs> and, you know, mm. and, and your whole sort of outlook changes a bit. But I think something I. I think I already said it a little bit. I get great satisfaction out of seeing other people come through, and that's sort of where I'm. I'm sat now is I, I like the idea that I can bring through other younger people that maybe still have more energy than I do, and go, yeah, you know, I'll show you how to set up an event. I'll show you how to get involved in an event. But you know, when when the band finishes, I'm going to pay them and I'll make sure everyone's paid, and I'll. I'll say goodbye to the people I need to say goodbye to and I'll be going home. And if, if people are still hanging around and the band wants to stay up and have a late drink and they want to go around town and go mad, you, my young Padua, can do that. That's, mm. what, that's what I need. If anybody wants to apply mm. to be Gaz's Padua, <laughs> uh, find my email online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think that's something where... Again, this is something I was talking about with um, Sam on the last podcast where, um, so when I was younger, starting out in the industry, you know, kind of late teens, early 20s. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I really set out with the idea of like, you know, I want to be a professional musician. Mm. Um, and it's not like, you know, I never wanted to be famous or anything, but I saw myself as um, as being a failure if if I didn't, get out there and and you know sort of have whatever like a, a certain degree of success and, and yeah be, you know be able to make my money off music as yeah a, as a performer yeah yeah and it, it it you know now i have a completely different outlook and i actually think that um you know the people who because I, I always looked at you know i'm being in my early 20s and when some of my musician friends that i knew uh they started to get the day jobs and i was like oh i'm never gonna be that yeah never yeah, gonna yeah. be that guy if i get the day job yep, then i failed <laughs> and now i look at it completely different because actually um you know i i think if you can find a, a way whatever way it is to facilitate doing what you love doing in a way that you can make it comfortable yeah. for you to live well which is different for everybody and you know for some people they can be the big rock star musician or whatever um mm. and do that until you know forever yeah but, yeah know, some people can't yeah yeah um you know i mean not everyone's like paul mccartney you know? exactly <laughs> i was gonna say i mean i do think that being a musician does have a timeline on it for a lot of people because a, I think the older you get, the more in, out of touch you get with with younger people. So it's harder to write songs that appeal to younger people, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like we we're just talking about, you get tired. You can't do the late shows. You can't go on tour and be living in, in, in out of service stations and all that sort of stuff. Once you get a certain age, and certainly once you get settled down and have and have other responsibilities such as your own children or your your mortgage to pay and stuff like that, you know. And so you do have to. And, and I think everyone. It's, it's sort of 
it's not taboo, but it sort of is a little bit. I think everyone sort of starts out with music with the idea of, I want to be a musician, I want to be a rock star, I want to be playing my own songs, and I want them to be on the radio, and I want to make money off them. And, you know, in your teens and 20s, like you were just saying. But there's so many other things in the music industry to do that are very satisfying as somebody that loves music and is into it. And, you know, in a similar frame as to what you were saying, that's exactly how I started out. But actually, my view of it now is that I feel very lucky that over my last 20 odd years of my career, I've managed to build enough contacts up so I can get jobs now that are paid well, that I'm comfortable in and I have get enjoyment out of um, doing things that are related to events and management and um, events management and music and um, putting on gigs and being involved in gigs. And then I can do my music as just a side project that's, not a vanity project as such, but I don't really care. Like, I don't mm. really care what other people feel. I do it for me now, and I enjoy it. And, you know, I get I, I get a great amount of satisfaction when I, I see other people enjoying it. But it isn't about me being the rock star anymore like it was when I was in my 20s. It isn't just about I, I want people to dance to my music. It's I want to play music because it gives me a sense of satisfaction writing songs let and the outlet of expression for me and if i play those songs and other people like them and they clap and they you know they want to buy my cd or, or download my, my my song off the internet or whatever then great you know that's lovely but actually you know like you were saying the most important thing for me now is that i'm comfortable and that i i don't feel the pressure i used to i think mm. you know in your 20s you put a lot of pressure on yourself to be this great musician this great performer this successful musician but actually there's so many things in this industry that you can do um rather than just be a performer and the thing with performing is as i say once you get to a certain age it becomes harder and harder to make money off that and and it's a crazy life you know i know people who do that and it's crazy you know you, you you're having you never see your family you're traveling all the time you you, you know you, you have to go mad hours there's a lot of pressure on you from labels and stuff to hit deadlines with certain things and and i think it probably does take the enjoyment out of it to some extent you know mm. it's lovely if you can make good money out of it but then it's lovely to make good money out of any job so you know yeah, yeah. what's the difference and i think for me now the most important thing when it comes to my music is that i enjoy it and that uh, I connect with the other people that I'm making music with. Mm, no, definitely. And and yeah, key word that you said there is is pressure. You know, you can alleviate that pressure from yourself because because yeah, some people can can go out there. Um, you know, say if it is as a, a musician, and they can have like a good level of success and keep up with the the touring lifestyle. You know, having a record label deal all of that stuff having management and and you know and deal with all that pressure and and still come out writing good music and still enjoy it which is you know it's why i always have like huge respect for people don't realize like the the sort of ultra famous like musicians out there um the level of pressure yeah. yeah that they have to deal with and if they're still making good music like that's quite quite incredible yeah and, it is and it, I it takes a special talent like it's another thing that i i think i realized when i was at the maze was i saw so many bands at the maze who were great bands you know they'd, they'd come and they were local bands or small bands from london or wherever and they were on their first tour and they'd come and they'd play the gig and i'd be like musically these are great they write great songs they're all good musicians they're great performers there was 30 people in the crowd, but everyone loved it. These should be, be the biggest band in the world in five years' time, and they never are. And mm. it's there's so many bands, and you'll have seen the same working at music venues and doing sound. You see so many bands that are great bands that you go, well, what's the difference between them and whoever's the biggest rock band in the world at the moment? That's the difference between them and the Arctic Monkeys or them and U2 or them and Killers or whoever it is that's that's currently the biggest band in the world and and the difference is it's like we said earlier it's not just about talent and it's not just about hard work necessarily it's getting the balance right of all of that because you've got to be able to work with your label like you say work with your manager work with your sound engineer work with your tour managers work with your booking agent work with your pr manager your mark and mm. and, and also soak in that pressure and not have a mental breakdown and become a, a crazed crackhead you okay. know which we see so many musicians end up sadly doing you know and and it does take a lot to be, for 
musicians to do that. I think it is a, any musician that can have sustained success uh, is I, I envy because I think it's a very hard thing to do. And having dabbled a tiny amount in doing a bit of touring and b- b- releasing a few tracks here and there with bands, I know that I don't think I'd have ever been able to do that. Hence mm. why I'm probably never managed to do more, but I'm very pleased with what I have done. I've enjoyed it. So, yeah. you know, it's all about levels of, of self you know happiness and and self respect and stuff but um i think you know i don't i don't like to diss on any musician i can not like someone's music but if they're managing to live that dream and do it successfully like you say if you can if you can be a, a musician that writes a song and then 20 years later writes another song which is throughout the world renowned then you must be doing something right and you have got a special talent mm. oh absolutely yeah i couldn't agree more um yeah and i think i think that is the thing um you know where if if you it it's not you know uh, uh again going back to what i thought when i was you know in my early 20s i was like some kind of failure if i i didn't sort of achieve a certain vision that i'd set for myself i think naturally organically most people kind of you know there's there's that period of realization where it takes growing as a person yeah. to a degree to to sort of reach that point where you realize like oh actually you know i love doing this thing but i don't necessarily want to do it either completely for a living or or, or to whatever degree because there is external pressure that i add on well, to that and i create a whole ecosystem around myself yeah. as well of people reliant on me yeah. and that's not for everybody and you know that- well going back to what we, were ta- what, what we were talking about earlier with jake book i remember jake saying to me when he came and played that secret show at the maze he literally sort of said that to me he said you know what i'd really love gaz is to sit with you at the maze but he's got to go and see noel gallagher like i said earlier but he actually said i miss just being able to go to a gig and sit at a bar in a pub and i said what do you mean you miss it? he said i can't do that now if i go into any bar in the country i mean this was at the height of his success mm. so if i go into any pub in the country to a venue and sit at a bar i'll get 50 people come up to me and i have to have like a bodyguard with me most of the time or my manager with me and they're shooting me off into cars you know and he went watch when i go downstairs and leave the dressing room now there'll be a load of people outside and it was exactly like he said he said this is every night for me guys you know he went down the stairs there were screaming girls everywhere his bodyguard and his entourage sort of shuffled him out into the back street got him into his car and he went off to to go uh, to Huddersfield Bowl to play to 70,000 people with Noel Gallagher and the High Flying Birds you know and and I thought you know as much as for most of, I think maybe that was the point where I sort of went you know what I'm quite happy with what I'm doing because as much as I've dreamed all my life since I was a very young child of playing to stadiums full of people and having you know no having my songs at the top of the charts I looked at Jake that day and I thought you know what it's not all that is it like he is a kid who loves playing music but he's he, he's at a point where he's like you know the thing that plays on his mind the most is the fact that he's got to hit these deadlines that his management set him and that his label set him and that his talk manager sets him and actually he can't just go out and enjoy music. And I was like, one of my greatest things that I love the most in the world is uh, is playing music, you know, mm. and that's that's uh, and and watching music and being able to go to gigs. And I, I would hate it if I couldn't go to a gig, you know, um, yeah. because I would get mobbed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that, you know, that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily realize you know that there there's positives and negatives to having that kind of level of success and yeah um i, I think that's kind of like a a nice point to leave this conversation on that that it's all you know sort of relative to what you want to achieve and yeah. and seeing you know recognizing that you know success is all relative to kind of what you want out of your life um, yeah so to me you know that's something that i now realize that um you know so many of the people i know uh they're not rich and famous or some huge megastar but to me you know a lot of the people i really look up to and respect um i see as huge successes just because they have kind of achieved the things they wanted to and and they're very happy and content and i think when you talk to those people who have had a lot of success you know again at the maze i got to meet a few people who had had a lot of success and i actually think that most of them they never saw it as hunting for that success it was more just following the dream of 
of playing music for fun and enjoying it and that's still what they do you know people like bad manners and you know those guys who've been doing it for 60 years or something they still go out on stage and act like a bunch of teenage idiots Mm -hmm. every night and they enjoy it they're not doing it because they're you necessarily wanting to to be some cool rock and roll star all the time you know and 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 i think there's something to be said by that i think like you were saying earlier the pressure is something that too many people put on them but actually the people who really make it are those, those that that just follow their hearts a bit and just get on with it and, and just become part of a bigger thing than just being a rock star, but actually being part of a wider music family. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, well, um, yeah, thanks for coming on today. Pleasure. Um Yeah, it's been great chatting with you. Um, yeah, always lovely to see you, Mark. Yeah, no, likewise, yeah. But yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, there'll be plenty of more podcasts coming your way. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it as well. And we will see you guys again in the next one.